I'll start with this handout, okay? Uh, you've, had, you've seen a quote in here, I've seen it a couple times and I haven't been to every meeting, but you've seen a quote where Sister White says that when the great buildings of New York City are thrown down, then Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 is fulfilled. This of course has become a point of argument in Adventism that people would use that quote to identify 9-11 as the arrival of the latter rain. Um, but we had proved the arrival of the latter rain from many other biblical arguments long before we came across that quote. That quote just says it very well. This quote, if we had time to go through the entire article, this is a powerful article. But this was sent to me by a friend that's working in Africa. And he just sent me the very last paragraph. And so I'd like you to turn over to the second page, to the very last paragraph, and I'm going to, I'm going to cut into the middle of this, the paragraph before that, and I'm going to start there. It says, there are lessons. I'm in the middle of the second paragraph from the end, and it's bold face where I'm starting. There are lessons to be learned from history of the past. That's what Manny was doing for us. He was going through these past reform lines. And attention is called to these that all may understand that God works on the same lines that he has ever done. Now. now that he ever has done. His hand is seen in his work and among the nations now just the same as it has been ever since the gospel was first proclaimed to Adam and Edom. Adam and in Eden. Now notice this next quote in the context of what she just said. There are periods which are the turning points in the history of nations and of the church. 9-11. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. That's an amen, but the next part is extremely scary. If it is received, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. The Lord in His Word has opened up the aggressive work of the Gospel as it has been carried on in the past and will be in the future, even to the closing conflict when satanic agencies will make their last wonderful movement. From that word we understand that the forces are now at work that will usher in the last great conflict between good and evil, between Satan the Prince of Darkness and Christ the Prince of Life. But the coming triumph for men who love and fear God is as sure as the throne is established in the heavens. No secular human authority would say that 9-11 did not change the course of the history of the United States and neither would they say that it wasn't a crisis. That was the crisis that arrived in this generation and according to this, it's at that point that light is given to God's people and the light that's given to God's people has been reflected in these reform lines as a divine symbol coming down and when the divine symbol comes down he has a little book open in his hand and at that point God's people are required to take that light and eat it. If they accept it there is spiritual progress but if they refuse to eat the flesh and the blood of the Son of God, then they turn and they walk no more with Him forever. So this is just, I received that quote email just before we headed out this way and it's just too good not to put into the record, don't you think? <laughs> um, anyway, page 218 of the notes. All of this will be reviewed as we get started. In fact, after this week so far, probably everything I say will be review, and that's okay. Repetition is good. <laughs> the time of the end, 1798. The message was formalized in 1833. The angel descended in 1840. These are all in your note. The second angel's message arrives. I haven't been to all the meetings. I apologize if I'm, if I'm not aware if someone has dealt with the 1843 chart, but the 1843 chart was printed in May of 1842 and all the pioneers understood that this was a fulfillment 
of prophecy. It was a way mark. It was a way mark that they say if you read that the 1843 chart was produced by the Lord, then you left the foundations of Adventism. That's how the pioneers express it. This was the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2. All right? They knew it. They said, if you didn't understand the 1843 chart was a way mark, you left the foundation. Now, if you don't think it's an important way mark, what you need to understand is when, when this chart came into history, right here, William Miller gives, us, gives straight testimony. He said, before that time period, when I was predicting the end of the world in 1843, I was never dogmatic. He says, I always said, if my calculations are correct, then the Lord will return in 1843. He always qualified it with an if. But when this chart was produced, he says, then the brethren began to come to him and say, look it. This is, I'm paraphrasing this, but this is what he says happened. We have this chart now that's predicting the end of the world in 1843. We need to take the if out of our presentation. We need to be united. We're saying the end of the world's coming in 1843. We're standing on this chart. So seeing as Brother Miller, you're the figurehead of this movement, quit saying if. So William Miller, he took the if out of it in 1842 with the production of this chart. And then he says, that's when the whole denominated world turned against the message and the door closed. So brothers and sisters, when you're talking about this chart, you need to understand that the way mark of this history that finally closes the door on the first angel's message in large part is that chart. So when this history is repeated at the end of the world and suddenly these charts are being lifted up to God's people all over planet Earth today as this history is being repeated, it's saying the door is about to close. And the door is, and that's the argument. The argument is, is do you build your end time understanding in agreement with what the pioneers say about these wild horses? Do you build your end time agreement in agreement with what the pioneers say about the daily, the 1290, the 1335? Do you build your end time understanding in agreement with the 2520, or do you not? That's the argument. And that argument's being, being hammered out in Adventism today because now there's a group of people, just like here, they're saying, we stand on this chart. Amen. So you, 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 need to, you need to understand the significance of this. It's that this chart is what closes the door. And there's two door closings we're going to show you in each of these histories. And there's a door about ready to close on Adventism. Um, May of 1842, you have that in your notes on page 219. Uh, the tarrying time, the first disappointment here in 18... Eight, everyone understands that the first disappointment was in what year? 1843. That was the answer I wanted, but it wasn't. Okay, because they were operating on biblical time and they understood that the year 1843 ended on March 21st 1844. And therefore, the real disappointment of 1843 arrived in this history, March 22nd, 1844, even though we call it the disappointment of 1843. It was the disappointment of predicting the Lord would return in 1843 based upon the biblical reckoning of time. In the summer of 1844, the second angel's message is proclaimed, and at the Exeter camp meeting, that's August 12th through 17th, 1844. The midnight cry arrives, and I'm on page 220. Judgment arrives on October 22nd, 1844. Um, I've seen that we have read this quote on, the pa on page 220 um, in connection with the closing of the doors. I want to at least remind us of um, one principle in it that I'm going to try to deal with in the last two paragraphs. From Selected Messages, Book 1, page 63, I'm on page 220. It says, I was shown in vision and still believe that there was a short, shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angels' messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. 
And those who accepted it, and remember, what, we're gonna, what we should know already, but what we're going to demonstrate is the first and second angels' messages are repeated. Therefore, when they're repeated at the end of the world, all that saw the light on the first and second angels' message and reject it, the door is closed on them. Is that right? It's only half right. Because Sister White says we're not judged by the light that we have, but we're also judged by the light that we could have had if we would have veiled ourselves. So we were in a very precarious situation as Seventh-day Adventists when a message like this is being sounded within the borders of this church. We can run and put our head in the sand, but this is the close of probation. Anyway. And those who accepted it and received the Holy Spirit which attended the proclamation of the message from heaven and who afterward renounced their faith and pronounced their experience a delusion thereby rejected the Spirit of God and it no longer pleaded with them. Those who did not see the light had not the guilt of its rejection. It was only the class who had despised the light from heaven that the Spirit of God could not teach. When the third angel's message is finally going through history, here at the end of the world, testing people, the first people to be held accountable to that light are Seventh-day Adventists. Those, those people outside of Adventism aren't going to be held accountable till the Sunday Law. There's something that goes on in Adventism before the Sunday Law that is what we need to understand because we're going to be held accountable to whatever that light is. In page 221, uh, Pastor Carrasco has just finished that study of every Reformation is the same. You see several quotes identifying that the Millerite history is repeated, whether it's from Matthew 25, Daniel 12, Revelation 14. Um, on page 223, one thing that I want to put in the record that we're probably familiar with, you'll see four quotes there, don't need to read them. Angels, when we're talking about the angels of Revelation 14, and the angels of Revelation 10 and the angels of Revelation 18, those angels, I've heard more than once in these meetings, those angels represent Christ. That those angels represent the work that God's people accomplish. Okay, I'm not threatened by them being identified by Christ. Sister White does so. She identifies them as Christ. But they represent the work that is accomplished by the people of God. And the work that's accomplished by the people of God is accomplished by Christ. So they're, they're a very close connection. But when you're going to analyze the work, the process of the work of the Millerite history in order to identify the work that's accomplished at the end, then you should relate to the angels as representing a process of work, a two-step work. Uh, but it's also on the bottom of page 223 worth noting when we're dealing with Revelation 18, that the loud voice, the loud cry, what we call the loud cry, symbolizes an increase or an escalation of power. Okay, because we're going to say that the loud cry in its perfect fulfillment takes place after the Sunday Law, but we're going to say that the loud cry begins here when the mighty angel comes down, when the two twin towers came down on September 11th, 2001, but Sister White says the loud cry began in 1888 with Jones and Wagner. It's an increase of understanding of the third angel's message. So in, really, in reality, the loud cry of the third angel began on October 22, 1844. And every added piece of light to the understanding of the third angel's message is an escalating increase of power. But the perfect fulfillment of the loud cry is what takes place when the church is purified at the Sunday Law and the wheat and tares are separated, and those people that receive the seal of God then have the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon them. That's the perfect fulfillment. Okay, now to our study. The Millerite history repeated. A very long quote here. I'm not going to read the very long quotes. I'm going to point to you parts of them and let you be students of prophecy on your own time to see if, if I'm given an accurate reflection of what's being taught in some of these quotes. I've seen a nice quote that I hadn't recognized before in the last presentation by Pastor Carrasco that's teaching the same thing. And it, I think it's worth noting about this, but this is a different quote that teaches the same thing. And what this quote teaches is that the first angel of Revelation 14, the first angel arrives in history in 1798. Okay? But the angel that comes down out of heaven on August 11th, 1840. That's also the first angel. 
They're the same angel. The angels represent the work that God's people do. In 1798, the work that God's people had to do is they had to understand the increase of knowledge. They needed to get, get to work running to and fro in God's word to understand the increase of knowledge. But in Revelation 10, when the mighty angel comes down, the work then is empowered, and it, it's the same angel. I want you to see that. It's, we need to see that because when we line up the history down here, we want to understand that... The, work, the angel work that begins at the time of the end in 1989, it's the same angel that comes down in 2001 because these histories are repeated to the very letter. So, Uriah Smith says at the beginning of this quote on 225 under the title The Same Angel, he says, The chronology of the events of Revelation 10 is further ascertained from the fact that this angel is identical with the first angel of Revelation 14. Okay, he goes on to explain it more, but you understand my point. It's, it's correct that the first angel of Revelation 14, prophetically, when you're applying it to understand the, the sequence of the history, in the Millerite history, the first angel of Revelation 14 is the same angel as Revelation 10. You understand that? Say amen. amen. Now let me give you a trick question. I, I've, been, I've been waiting to give you this trick question. It's probably too early, but... Uh, the Millerites proclaimed the first angel's message, right? Yes. Oh, amen or no amen? amen. They did? Yeah. And the Millerite message is represented on this chart, right? Oh, no. The Millerite message is represented on this chart, correct? Amen. Can you show me the first angel of Revelation 14 on that chart? No. Not on that chart, is it? No. Trick question. How did the Millerites proclaim the first angel's message? They proclaimed it by proclaiming Daniel 8.14. The first angel's message is the hour of his judgment has come and Daniel 8.14 identifies when the judgment arrives. You may think, well, what's the point there? But what I want you to understand, and I could, and I could go long or short, I'll do a medium on this explanation. The Pharisees, okay? All these histories are burning to the end of the world. The Pharisees were defending the orthodox truth of their generation, were they not? They were keeping the law. They were defending the law, were they not? But they didn't really know the law. The law was standing right in front of them, and they didn't know it, right? Well, all these are examples of the end of the world. We're going to have Pharisees at the end of the world. And with one of the manifestations of a modern Pharisee, he's going to defend the orthodox truth. At the end of the world is a latter rain, right? 1888 is an illustration of the latter rain, right? What was Butler and his crew arguing about Jones and Wagner in 1888? Yeah, they're, they're tearing down the foundations. They're removing pillars. That was their claim. Were they? No. And Sister White says, no, all this talk about removing the pillars, I don't understand it. They were fulfilling Phariseeism. They were defending what they thought to be orthodoxy, but in fact, they were fighting the truth. This will happen at the end of the world. So my point is, there will be at the end of the world those that will defend orthodox, the orthodox message. And the orthodox message is the third angel's message. Every Seventh-day Adventist that's a good Pharisee knows that our message is the third angel's message. So we're going to defend the third angel's message. We're going to explain Revelation 14 to the very letter. But the history of the Millerites is repeated to the very letter. And when the Millerites proclaim the first angel's message, do you see Revelation 14 on this chart? No, the third angel's message is just like the first angel's message. It's a prophecy from the book of Daniel. What prophecy do you suppose is the third angel's message? Daniel 11, 40 to 45. But we're, if we're defending orthodoxy, we're going to say the third angel's message is found in Revelation 14. First angel's message was not found in Revelation 14. It is. It is. I hope you're getting my point. But when the Millerites proclaimed it, they proclaimed it from a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Amen. Daniel chapter 8. And Daniel chapter 8 is symbolized by the Uli River. The third angel's message is from a prophecy in Daniel 11, which is symbolized by the Hittical River. Sister White has a statement where she says something like this. I have it with me. I won't dig it out. She says, 
The prophecies given by the great rivers, the Uli and the Hittical, are now in the process of fulfillment, and soon all the scenes will come to pass. You ever read that quote? You've read that quote? Say amen. The testimony of two or three things established, you know I didn't make that up. Sister White points to the prophecy of the Uli and the prophecy of the Hittical, the prophecy of Daniel 8, the prophecy of Daniel 11. And you know what the Bible historians say in Daniel 12, when Daniel was receiving the visions there in Daniel 12, and he saw the holy being over the rivers and one saint on this side of the river speaking to another saint. You remember that part in Daniel 12? Where did the historians say that Daniel was? He was, he was, you know when George Bush went into Iraq? One of the, when they went into Baghdad, one of the first things they captured was a palace of Saddam Hussein. And it's set with Euphrates rivers on this side and the Tigris river on this side. And just beyond the palace, those two rivers come together. And, and the, the historians say that's where Daniel was when he seen this vision. He was right where the Tigris and the Euphrates, the great rivers of Shinar, the Uli and the Hittical, where they come together. Because see, the Uli and Hittical, when Sister White points this two of them and, and lifts those visions up, they come together. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is Daniel 8, 14, period. They're the same vision. I mean, brothers and sisters, we're raised up. If we're going to proclaim the third angel's message, we're raised up to identify the events connected with the close of probation. And the events connected with the close of probation is the last six verses of Daniel 11, is it not? Amen? Amen. That's our job, to announce the close of probation as identified in the last six verses of Daniel 11. But where's the opening of the judgment? Daniel 8, 14. They're the same vision. The one vision says this is where it begins. The other vision says this is where they end. They come together. Brothers and sisters, the third angel's message is established in the book of Daniel. And when it's proclaimed, Revelation 14 is fulfilled. In your notes, on page 226, Speaking of the Millerite history under the power of the Holy Spirit manifested from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 109, it says, In history and prophecy, the Word of God portrays, portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Drop down to the next paragraph. A transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angel's message as it attends the message of the third. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. Last sentence, the Lord revealed himself to us. Light was shed on doctrine. Light was shed on country living. Life was shed on dress reform. Light was shed on the prophecies. And we knew that we received divine instruction. Amen. To receive the prophetic message is to receive divine instruction. If we're going to be settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, we need to understand the prophecies, sure enough. But as we receive the prophecies and assimilate them, as we eat them, that's divine instruction. That's the Word of God. How was the heaven and the earth created? It has creative power in it. Amen. By being settled in intellectually, by accepting and eating the increase of knowledge, that increase of knowledge transforms me where I'm not only settled into the truth intellectually, but I'm settled in spiritually. And brothers and sisters, you can't separate the two, even though many try to do so. And many will lose their salvation for doing so. But in this history here, this whole history, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested, transforming power. But then in the next quote from Great Controversy 611, she especially highlights 1840 to 1844. This whole history the transforming power of the Holy Spirit is accomplished, but in this history, when the angel comes down, then it's even highlighted even more. Brothers and sisters, this history, since 1989, is being repeated. The increase of knowledge that's in this history possesses transforming power.
power. I don't know everyone in this room, and, and, and I, want you to, I want you to respond to this question, but this isn't a question. You know, sometimes you can have a question like this, and you can say, everyone in the room that loves Jesus, will you please stand up? And you know everyone's going to stand up, because even if there's someone that honestly doesn't love Jesus, they're not going to be willing to, to suffer the peer, peer pressure and sit there when all the rest of the people stand up. This isn't that kind of question. But to me, this is a nice question to ask. How many in this room have ever given testimony to someone else that this prophetic message that we're listening to this week has changed their life? Will you please stand up? Brothers and sisters, this you can sit down. This prophetic message has transforming power. Praise Jesus. Amen. This history, the Holy Spirit was manifested and lives were changed. This history is repeating. And this prophetic message has transforming power. But you know what I need if I'm going to receive that transforming power? I have to have faith. I have to believe that it has transforming power. I have to believe that it's that message. I'm getting way off track. Okay. Under repeated, page 226. These speakers here pushed a lot of buttons on me all week long that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to respond to. I'm sorry. Um, under repeated, we, there's a couple and there are several quotes like this just to, to lock it in place. From Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, page 40. The whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of the Lord. That's Revelation 18. The pure in heart shall see God. It is those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth that will receive power, that transforming power, from the angel that came down from heaven having great power. The first message is to be repeated, proclaiming the second advent of Christ to our world. The second angel's message are to be repeated. The first angel and second angel's message were fulfilled in this history. They're to be repeated in this history. Okay? And there's another quote underneath it that says the same thing. On the top of page 227, this is a quote that when I'm dealing with what Pastor Carrasco was dealing with a few times, I like to use this quote, you, you know, when he was telling us that the second message is always preceded by a first message and followed by a third message. This quote here is very good to nail that down, I believe. Dropping down to the first sentence that is bold-faced from Selected Messages, book 2, page 1-4, Speaking of the messages, it says there cannot be a third without a first and a second. So when he's saying the fourth message is the second message, she's saying if you have one of the messages, you have to have the other two. If there can't be a third without a first and a second, then if you have a first, there's got to be a second and a third. And if you have a second, there's got to be a first and a third. So if you can establish that the fourth is a second, <laughs> then the fourth has to have a first and a third, right? Okay, so that's what she's saying, and this is important to understand. Because what produces the second message is the first message. The first message is a fearful denunciation of sin. This is where I'd like to take issue with Pastor Taylor. What I heard him say, I heard him saying he went to 1 John 4, 17 and 18, that this message... This message provides perfect love that casts out fear. This message is not fearful, and I know we agree on this. I'm just making a point. But this message, this message isn't for a sanctified Christian. This message is for a Laodicean, and there isn't any Laodiceans that have the perfect experience. They have the imperfect experience. And this message is the most fearful message ever ever given to mankind and it's given to Seventh-day Adventists first. Amen. And if we don't receive this message and come to the foot of the cross where we can obtain that experience, then we don't ever fulfill 1 John chapter 4. This message is scary. I don't know how many men and women I've had come to me through the years after a presentation walking up with tears saying, I get it. I see it. What can I do? I'm not prepared. My family's not prepared. Tears running down their face. Can't count. This is a scary message. And it's always the case. 
The first message is a conviction of sin. Are you ready to close your probation, brothers and sisters? We're in the judgment of the living. The latter rain is falling. And probation is about to close. How much scarier can that get? You know how you can get it just a little more scarier? Add in the component that we're Laodicean, which is the most difficult human beings of all history to arouse with the sense of the Spirit of God. That's who we are, according to Scripture. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. These messages were to give in the, to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history the things which have been and the things which will be. Parallel, we looked at this quote in the last presentation. Our history is to parallel the Millerite history. We considered in the last presentation, this makes it pretty nice, Revelation 18 has how many angels? Two angels. The first angel, you have it on your, your notes from Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, comes down out of heaven. He cries out, Babylon is fallen. And then in verse 4, there's another voice. If there's another voice, it's another angel. This history of the Millerites is a two-step work. The two steps, the first angel, the second angel. Revelation 18 is the repeat of this history, and there are two voices. The first angel, the second angel. But that's not commonly understood by Adventists, but it doesn't really matter. It's right there in the Word of God, and Ellen White backs it up 100%. It's about the work. The angels represent the work that is accomplished by God's people through the power of the Holy Spirit. The bottom of page 227, we looked at this in the last presentation. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. That's the first angel's message. Fearful conviction of sin. And the second message, righteousness is manifested that leads to judgment. All of these lines identify that. And the message that we're proclaiming now, brothers and sisters, it's the message to Laodicea, which is a fearful identification of the condition we're in. It's a conviction of sin. And should you and I respond correctly to the message to the Laodiceans, we will demonstrate the righteousness of Christ and proclaim his character to a dying world all the way until judgment closes. It's the same, same thing that's always been. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Next page from Psalm 77, 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Every Seventh-day Adventist understands this, right? We first come to the courtyard. We slay the lamb. There's the conviction of sin. That blood's carried into the holy place where we see the righteous life illustrated in the symbols. And from the holy place, we move into the most holy place where judgment is accomplished. It's the identical process. Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay. If you see it, say amen. Okay. Now, Great Controversy 389. This is where I'm trying to get to. I wanted to get here earlier, but I didn't. Okay. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and they that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Not until this condition shall be reached, and the union of church and the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom, will the fall of Babylon be complete. Brother Rick, this was the quote I was speaking about. The change is a progressive one. And the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14, 8 is yet future. Ha <laughs> ha, Pastor Carrasco. I thought, I thought I heard you say that the second angel's message arrived here in 1842. Did I hear you say that? Was the second angel's message fulfilled in 1842? Sister White says that the perfect fulfillment of, Rev of the second angel's message is yet future. And she said that after 1842, did she not? So if this is the imperfect fulfillment of the second angel's message, then what is the imperfect fulfillment? where you started in your study. What's the imperfect fulfillment? That's a hard question. You can't know what I'm thinking. It's a type. 
it's a type of the perfect fulfillment, which is the anti-type. And when's the perfect fulfillment of the second angel's message? Pardon me? Fourth angel, Revelation 18, verse, verse 2. If you want to get specific, Babylon is fallen, right? That's the perfect fulfillment. And therefore, that's the, the fulfillment in Revelation 14, right? Verse, verse 7? Let's look there so we get, get clear. Verse 8. I can't believe that I don't even have my Bible out, but I don't. Revelation 14. Now, what I'm saying here... Sometimes, I've tried to share this with people before and sometimes I lose them on this, this one. I, I obviously don't do it well, so you're going to have to think this one through. Okay? Verse 7 is the first angel's message, is it not? Yes. Okay, verse 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The perfect fulfillment of verse 8 was not in the Millerite history, it's at the end of the world. Is that not what Sister White says? Yes. Okay. So the perfect fulfillment of the third angel's message, it wasn't in the Millerite history either, was it? Okay. Do you see that? Do you believe it? Okay. So, um, on, your, on your notes, or you can stay right there in your Bible if you wish. In Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. And we have a reference we'll get to here, Lord willing, in a couple of presentations, where Sister White says, The everlasting gospel that was proclaimed by the Millerites is the same gospel that was proclaimed in Eden. And the gospel that was proclaimed in Eden in Genesis 3.15 was a promise that Christ would put enmity in the heart of his followers against sin. Okay, that, that was the promise, is that there would be two classes. I will put enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. That's Genesis 3.15, and Sister White says that's the everlasting gospel. That's the everlasting gospel of the first angel's message, and that's the everlasting gospel that the Millerites preached, and that's the everlasting gospel that we have to take to the world. Amen. And the everlasting gospel, if you boil it down to, Rev to Genesis 3.15, is a promise that the Lord will produce two classes of worshipers. And the Millerites didn't simply proclaim the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel. They experienced it. Because through this increase of knowledge, when they got to October 22nd, 1844, there were two classes of worshipers. One had moved into the most holy place with Christ, and one was praying to Satan. Right? But when all that all took place, that was not a perfect fulfillment of the three angels' messages. It was an imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' messages. But now, so... With some things in place, let's walk through Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. The son of their angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. What's that mean? That's William Miller's message, is it not? That's our message. The, this process, the everlasting gospel, there's first a conviction of sin. There's a fearful warning message. Fear God. If I receive that message, what do I do? I give glory to God as righteousness is manifested right here. Do you see it? For the hour of His judgment has come. When did the, when did the hour of His judgment come? October 22, 1844. Now, do you, you may not know what I'm doing yet, but I want you to see this. The first angel's message was perfectly fulfilled by the Millerites. The first angel's message is in this history. Because Miller's message is fear God. And in the second angel's message, they gave him glory. And when the third angel's message arrived, the hour of his judgment had arrived. Right? Now, in the prophetic lines, what follows next? Yeah, the fourth, that's not my question. What follows next is disappointment and the number seven. And in the Millerite history, what's that number seven represent? The Millerites have to understand the Sabbath. They have to proclaim it, correct? So what's, this, what's it say? Saying with a loud, loud voice, Fear God, first angel's message, William Miller. And give him glory. The manifestation of righteousness in the midnight cry. 
For the hour of his judgment has come, October 22nd, 1844, and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's the Sabbath. Okay, so, so when you talk about Revelation 14, you have Sister White saying the perfect fulfillment of the second angel's message is in the future. This is the second angel's message down here at the end of the world. Is it not? Babylon has fallen. This is Revelation 18, verse 2. If you're going to talk about perfection, correct? Do you see it? And what is the third angel's message of Revelation 14? It's a warning about the mark of the beast. Did the mark of the beast test arrive on October 22nd, 1844? It was not a perfect fulfillment. The perfect fulfillment is down here in verse 4 of Revelation 18 with the call, Come out of her, my people. That's the third angel's message. So you may not have seen it before, but brothers and sisters, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 is the complete history of Adventism from the beginning to the end. And the imperfect fulfillment of the three angels' message took place in the Millerite history as they fulfilled the first angels' message, as they experienced the first angels' message, because there was two classes of worshipers when it was all said and done. And how did they do that? By proclaiming a prophecy from the book of Daniel. Right? You see it? Okay. So let's look at these three angels' messages a little bit closer upon the testimony of two or three things established under the first witness. I want to show you the, the, the characteristics of what it means that Babylon has fallen. All right? And the first time Babel is clearly identified as falling is in Genesis 10 and 11. And you'll see under patriarchs and prophets, under a message rejected, Sister White says this, But at what loss, what a loss to those who had set themselves against God. This is after the flood. It was his purpose that as men should go forth to found the nations in different parts of the earth, they should carry with them a knowledge of his will, that the light of truth might shine undimmed to succeeding generations. Noah, the faithful preacher of righteousness, lived for 350 years after the flood. Shem for 500 years. Now notice this. And thus their descendants had opportunity to become acquainted with the requirements of God and the history of his dealing with their fathers. But they were unwilling to listen to these unpalatable truths. They had no desire to retain God in their knowledge. And by the confusion of tongues they were in great measure shut out from the intercourse with those who ha might have given them life. Brothers and sisters, the, immediately after the flood, there was a warning message given to that generation. It was carried by Noah's descendants. There was a warning message, but Nimrod and his cohorts, they rejected that message. Right? Do you see that? Okay. On the testimony of two or three of the things established, you'll see this. It's as simple to see. When a warning message is rejected, then there is a pronouncement identifying that the warning message has been rejected. And sure enough, in Genesis 11, 5 through 8, the Lord comes down to look at the work that Nimrod and his cohorts are doing, and, they, and the Lord determines they've went too far. So what does he do? He passes judgment upon them. He scatters them. He confuses their language. That's the sequence connected with the fall of Babylon. There is a warning message. When that warning message is rejected, there is a pronouncement that it has been rejected, which is followed by a judgment. It's the same old story. Sin, righteousness, judgment, courtyard, holy place. Most holy place. First angel's message. Second angel's message. Third angel's message. That's why Sister White, one of the reasons she says, you can't have a third without a first and a second. Because what brings the second into history is the rejection of the first. If there's no first message, there will never be a second message. If there's nothing to be rejected, then there's not going to be a pronouncement that they've rejected the message. Second testimony. This is a good one when it comes to the 2520, brothers and sisters, and we, we haven't time to read it because we're kind of on a short leash here. In Daniel, we see the fall of, ba of Belshazzar's Babylon from Daniel chapter 5. I mean, it's easy to see this one. When Daniel comes in and the handwriting's on the wall and Belshazzar's paranoid as he should be, 
Daniel comes to him and he says, you had a warning message. Your warning message was your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. He says that. He tells him the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, though you knew all this, Belshazzar's warning message, the first angel's message for Belshazzar, was the testimony of his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel point, plainly said it. But Belshazzar rejected the warning message. And therefore, a pronouncement came. Many, many, tekel yefarsin. There's the pronouncement. And then, that very night, Belshazzar met his judgment. A warning message. Rejected brings a pronouncement that the warning message has been rejected, and it's followed by judgment. Do you see the, the simplicity of that? Okay, so that, that, of course, it's easy to see the third witness. Miller, the Millerites, they bring a warning message. It was empowered here. But the churches, especially after they started being dogmatic with this chart, the churches closed their doors, it's rejected. Then, in the summer of 1844, there is a pronouncement. Babylon has fallen. And then, what follows? Judgment. Now you, this one, we've, we've, we've moved through. You, there's no way, I don't think, that you could understand what this is. Even after I explain it to you, it may be difficult. But please follow me. This is called the prophetic mirror. We're going to switch gears for a minute before we come into Revelation 18. And it has to be for a minute. This is what you would call a chiasm or a chiasm. I don't know how the, the theologians pronounce it. Chiasm. But it's not. A chiasm is, is the, the poetic language of the Bible that will start at one stair step. And as the story in the Bible continues, it will take another step another step, another step, until it reaches the top step, and then it will step down, step down, step down, and step down, and the last step is identical to the beginning step, and the second step is identical to the step before the last step, and that's a chiasm, and you can see him throughout Scripture, and it's part of God's signature that proves that he wrote the Bible. But this is a chiasm, but it's different, because it's not in the Scriptures, it's in prophetic history. All right, And I'm not sure everything that this is supposed to teach us, but it teaches us one thing. It gives us a second testimony to the fact that judgment begins with Seventh-day Adventists. Okay? You'll see under the prophetic mirror that here, 1755, you have a great earthquake. All right? And this history, this prophetic history, is going to move right into here to where the door closes on October 22nd, 1844. In 1793, you have the French Revolution. French Revolution, Sister White says, illustrates the chaos at the end of the world. In 1798, the papacy receives a deadly wound. This is in your notes, brothers and sisters, on page 230, 231. And then from 1840 to 1844, you have a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Do you not? You guys are writing this down and it's in your notes. And, and then in 1844, the door closes, does it not? So what I'm saying is, you have a prophetic step, 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 that leads to the close of the door for the Millerites, and when the door closes for Adventists, the, this leads to the close of the door of the beginning of Adventism, and when you get to the point in time where the door closes at the end of Adventism, and when is that? the Sunday Law, then you will see all these things here illustrated, but they will be illustrated in a reverse order. The door closes here at the Sunday Law, okay? And uh, let, me, let me get, I left one out. We also have in here on 5A, the door closes on Babylon in here, but um, I'm, I'm going to just move forward. Um, the door closes here for us at the end of the world at the Sunday Law. Now it's going to reverse outward. The door closes for Babylon after the Sunday Law when human probation closes. We have a manifestation of the power of God at that time. 
All right, and I'll go back and tie these together. The manifestation of the power of God is when Michael stands up. The temple is filled with smoke. Um, and then we have the waters of the Euphrates dried up. And then we have a Armageddon. And I left one out, one line out. And then we have a great earthquake. Okay. So you have these in your notes. Let's just work back, because this isn't that big. Of, I don't want to spend a great deal of time here. The great earthquake that's in the seventh plague corresponds with the, with the great earth, earthquake in 1798. 1755. 1755. Armageddon. The French Revolution in 1793 is an illustration of Armageddon. Okay. Um, the drying up of the Euphrates to bring down modern Babylon is illustrated when the papacy receives its deadly wound in 1798. Okay. The manifestation of the power of God when the temple is filled with smoke at the beginning of the seven last plagues corresponds to the manifestation of the power of God there. Unfortunately, um, I didn't have this laid out for us per perfectly. This is 1842 when Babylon falls, which corresponds to the fall of Babylon when Michael stands up. And this is where the door closes in both histories. This is 1844, and this is the Sunday Law. This should be there. Now what I'm saying is this, brothers and sisters, and this is an important point for where we're going, perhaps. This gives evidence to what we're told here on page um, Page 230 of your notes from 1 Peter 4.17. For the time that time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what, in, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? In the Millerite history, which was repeated to the very letter, those people outside the Millerite movement closed their door first. Then the Millerites closed their door here. Do you see that? But this is a second testimony that at the end of the world, judgment begins with the house of God. Because there's going to be two doors that close in this history, just like there's two doors that close in this history. But there's a reversal in this end time history. This is one way you can show the reversal. Another way, Pastor Taylor, if you can remember back, he did it. Jeremiah 25 is spot on. Spot on. Jeremiah 25 is marking the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. That's where the prophecy is. Verse 12, Jeremiah 25. Sister White says that she, she lines up the 70 years with the 1260 years of Dark Ages. I have it in my notes. They're parallel histories. We'll get to that. So 1798 is the end of the 70 years. It's the end of the 1260 years prophetically. And it, so in this history, which is repeated in our history, Jeremiah is given a cup. He's saying, take it to the nations. Every one of them is going to drink. Okay, this is, they filled up their cup of iniquity, now they're going to drink the cup of God's wrath. But Jeremiah is specifically told, where does he take that cup first to? Jud judgment begins at the house of God. Okay? Three witnesses. This is a little bit hard to, hard to follow without taking some time to it, but the Bible plainly says judgment begins with the house of God. So what am I saying? I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, and this is where we're going to. This is the whole punchline, and I'm out of time, but so be it. This history is repeated. There's a warning message that comes in this history. It's a life or death warning message. It is the most fearful message ever given to mankind. And when it is rejected, there will be a pronouncement that it's rejected. But before it's rejected, before it's rejected, an angel comes down and empowers it. And on September 11, 2001, the angel of Revelation 18 descended and the warning message was empowered and that generation was being tested. And the angel comes down in verse 1 and the earth is lightened with his glory. And then in verse 2, there's a pronouncement Babylon is fallen as it's fallen. Revelation 18, verse 2, is it not? Does not, not what it says? 
That's followed by judgment. Where's judgment executed on the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Right here at the Sunday Law. Correct? Everyone with me? Therefore, brothers and sisters, in between September 11, 2001 and the Sunday Law, there's going to be someone, a group of people, that reject this message. Where's judgment begin? Adventism is being tested. The latter rain is falling. And in this history, right here today, right now, those people in Adventism, how, how does she say it? Those people that do not receive the light for this time, if it is received, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. Seventh-day Adventists right now are being tested by this message. If they reject this message, they're going to be totally void of the Holy Spirit and they're going to receive the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and it can be demonstrated if we have more time that the strong delusion comes upon Adventism before the Sunday Law. This leads to the conclusion, brothers and sisters, that some of you have only been studying this message for a few months. Some of us have been studying it for a few years or more and we're privileged. And this is hard for you probably to receive, but the punchline of this is, is when you hear this message now, if you don't receive it and bring it into your life, you're going to die. There is no waiting period now. We are in the judgment of the living. It's take the message, eat it, let it transform your life, or you're going to die. That's the testimony of inspiration. That's one of the reasons that this is the most fearful message ever given to mankind. But there's more powerful power in this message than any other message of all time because it has all the accumulated light of the whole Bible boiled into this message and God's word never fails and God's word is his creative word and if we will but eat it, he will transform us into his image. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that are considered as the wise virgins, but we understand that as Laodice Laodiceans, all the virgins are asleep, but we see that we are right at the very end of time and that some of us are now being aroused and that they have but a short time to, to decide on this message, upon this experience, and upon this work. I ask that you would bring conviction on each and every heart in this room that this is a message that can't be put on the shelf for a later time, but it has to be received and acted upon here and now. We thank you for letting us be such a small percentage of Adventism that is actually considering these things. And we ask that you would open the doors that we can carry this message to others that need to Consider these things as well and ask for your continued blessing upon this meeting. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.